Okay, thank you very much for that warm introduction and welcome everybody. We're glad Thanks. to have you here. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you. And hopefully you can all see that. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So as, as was mentioned, the topic is physical rehabilitation. Why is it important and what can I do in my practice right now? Because I think there are all different uh, levels of sophistication when it comes to rehab. The nice thing about rehab though, is even if you do a little bit of it, then you're doing uh, more good than you realize. Things such as uh, passive range of motion and controlled leash walks are better than doing nothing. A lot of the treatments that we have in veterinary medicine, if you don't do the complete treatment, it may make things worse. For example, if you have a urinary tract infection and you only give the antibiotic every second or third day, you're probably doing more harm in building resistant bacteria. But with rehab, even a little bit does a lot. So that's the important message. So why is rehabilitation important? Virtually any patient that has an acute injury or a post-operative orthopedic or neurologic condition, and we include fractures, cruciate ligament rupture, neurologic conditions such as a disc herniation, what all of those uh, disease processes or injuries have in common is that there are changes to the cartilage, the bone, the muscle, the tendons, and the ligaments. And those changes are related to atrophy or weakening of the tissues. We were talking about injuries and things that are common. And what we have in common with a number of musculoskeletal as well as neurologic injuries are atrophic changes to all of the tissues of the musculoskeletal system. And if we take an example, let's say we have an acute rupture of the cranial cruciate ligament if we don't do any rehabilitation after surgery, they can lose up to one third of their muscle mass within the first month. Now that's a tremendous amount of muscle atrophy, one third of their muscle mass, and it can take over a year to regain that mu uh, muscle mass, or in some cases you may not have complete recovery. So very important to try and initiate rehabilitation early prior to all of those deleterious changes occurring. For example, one thumb rule is for every day that muscle atrophy is allowed to occur, it takes three to five days of rehabilitation to regain that muscle mass. So you can see that if you do work on the front end immediately after surgery to prevent atrophy, there's less work to do in the future. So early rehab is very important. So the benefits of physical therapy, what are some benefits? Well, certainly we know that there's increased speed of recovery. There are a couple of studies now in um, neurologic cases, primarily disc herniation cases that demonstrate that if you start rehab very early, dogs are able to stand in roughly half the time and they're able to walk in roughly half the time as compared to conservatively managed cases. There are positive psychological effects for the pet and the owner. We like to encourage the owners to do some of the exercises at home. And when they do that, they really become more in tune to their pet. They pick up little things, little improvements that they may have missed before. But because they're so intimately involved with the process, they really can appreciate the pet even more. Overall, we want to improve performance and quality of movement. For example, if we have pain in a joint, it may alter the gait pattern and the use of the other joints in the limb. And that puts a lot of extra stresses on other areas of the body. So we want to improve the quality of movement to help maintain the health of the entire body. We also want to maintain strength and endurance. In the US and most areas of the world, um, obesity is a big problem in pets. And so they have poor stamina, they have poor strength and endurance. And so with rehab, we're trying to improve the strength. We're trying to improve not only the cardiovascular uh, endurance of the patient, but also the muscle endurance of the patient. So all of these are benefits of early rehab. 
we want to improve the biomechanics and flexibility. Dogs with hip dysplasia have pain with hip extension, and therefore they don't want to do things like go up and down stairs, jump up into vehicles or onto furniture. So what happens is the muscles undergo adaptive shortening. If they're not being used, then for example, the iliopsoas muscle undergoes adaptive shortening. And now when you try to extend the hip to a normal position, you end up causing pain because you're overstretching that shortened muscle. And so with rehab, we hope to improve the flexibility of tissues and improve the biomechanics. There are techniques that we can use in rehab to help reduce pain. Some of them as simple as cryotherapy or applying an ice pack to an injured area, all the way up to transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS to help reduce pain. Rehab is non-invasive. For whatever reason, owners may not wish to do any type of um, uh, surgery. And so they look for conservative ways of managing things. Now, there are certainly situations where surgery is indicated, but they may have a bad experience with prior dogs under anesthesia. The dog may have um, cardiac disease or liver or kidney disease that makes the anesthesia more risky. And so therefore, they may opt to do a non-invasive approach to manage the problem. There are minimal complications with rehab when it's done correctly. Now, you can certainly do damage if it's done incorrectly, but done properly, rehab has very few complications, so that's good. We hope to improve the uh, ability of the owner to recognize other problems. For example, if we have a cranial cruciate ligament on one side, uh, oftentimes we end up with a cruciate ligament rupture on the other side. And so the owners can be more in tune to what's happening, pick up the problem sooner and get it treated before it becomes highly arthritic. And hopefully we can help prevent future injury through proper strengthening and conditioning. So the rehab team, um, generally veterinarians and veterinary nurses receive virtually uh, no training in rehab, whereas human physiotherapies receive no training in veterinary medicine. So it's very important to develop collaborative working relationships so that we can help advance the care of patients. And there are a variety of different practice uh, schemes available. Some practices will have a dedicated area for rehab uh, practice. Others have a physiotherapist on staff. Others have just a small room for rehab. There are all different ways of involving the rehab team. So what are some conditions that we specifically can treat that might benefit from physical therapy? Well, certainly young dogs with elbow dysplasia, fragmented coronoid process, ununited ankyneal process, osteochondritis dissecans, all of these components of elbow dysplasia will result in severe arthritis as we see in the dog here. We have a lot of reaction, we have osteophytes. Um, this dog has a fragmented coronoid process of the elbow here and a lot of secondary arthritic changes. So those dogs can benefit from rehab, particularly things like aquatic therapy and range of motion. Fractures of the elbow are also common, especially lateral condylar fractures in puppies and young dogs. Those can all benefit from physical rehabilitation. We've already mentioned hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is a very common um, cause of lameness that we recognize in dogs. And depending on what stage they're at, if they're a young dog, certainly we recommend surgery. If they're an older dog, we oftentimes will initiate conservative treatment prior to any type of um, uh, surgical treatment, such as a femoral head and neck excision that you see here on the right, or a total hip replacement. But things that we can do, we can change the exercise to reduce the impact on the hip. We can do exercises to help improve the flexibility and mobility of the hip. We can alter the diet for weight loss and certainly medications are an important part of that. But if we do end up doing surgery on the case, such as this femoral head and neck excision, 
Rehabilitation is extremely important to the outcome. Without good rehab postoperatively, we're going to have severe muscle atrophy, we'll have excessive scar tissue and loss of motion of the joint. So very important to start rehab literally the day of surgery. We see a lot of cranial cruciate ligament ruptures. The um, picture here that you see is an arthroscopic view and you can see the torn cruciate ligament fibers here. It kind of looks like the end of a mop. And most of our cases are due to ligament degeneration as opposed to an acute sporting injury. Uh, but this is probably our, our main type of case that we do with orthopedic rehab. Of course, luxating patellas are another very common cause of knee problems in dogs. As an example, this was one of our first study that was done on dogs with cranial cruciate ligament rupture. And we broke the dogs into two groups. We randomized them. And the no rehab group or the no PT group here had virtually no uh, formal rehab. They were walked several times a day, but no particular attention was paid to how they used the limb or doing any additional treatments. The dogs in the rehab group, they had passive range of motion, cryotherapy, slow leash walks, neuromuscular electrical stimulation to stimulate muscle contraction. And then towards the end of the 14 day rehab period, they um, receive some aquatic therapy. And what we're looking at here is stifle extension. Now, normally after surgery, they're painful. It's difficult to extend the stifle. So we have a reduced stifle extension angle in both groups. But over time, you can see that there's been no change at all in the group not receiving rehab. The group that is receiving rehab, they improve to pretty much normal knee extension by day 14. And even though those dogs were then released to their owners with no additional rehab, they maintained that extension and even improved it a little bit over the 90 day study period. Now, why is it important to have good range of motion? Well, this was another study where we um, did a surgical model and, and transected the cruciate and then immediately stabilized the stifle. These dogs had no formal rehab but you can see that some of them have pretty good knee extension by the end of the 10 week study period. Some of them had um, a relatively poor knee extension. And when we look at the weight bearing as measured by a force plate, you can see that those dogs that had better stifle extension actually had less lameness. Those with poor stifle extension were quite lame. So there is an association between um, range of motion, especially extension and lameness. And this has been shown in other studies. So certainly until we know the exact cause, it makes sense to try and maintain the stifle extension as well as possible. Neurologic disorders. The, um, the analogy to the orthopedic condition of a cranial cruciate ligament rupture is the intervertebral disc herniation uh, in the neurologic system. Very common in dogs with short legs and long backs, such as dachshunds. We have a lot of weakness and even paralysis in those cases. And rehab can be a very important part of the recovery. We can see in this myelogram here how much compression there is to the spinal cord. And so surgery and decompression followed by rehab are very important. Lumbosacral instability is also another common problem that we deal with, with uh, pain and uh, compression of nerve roots. And then we have peripheral nerve disorders or injuries, things like sciatic nerve uh, problems or radial nerve problems. These are generally related to trauma and the rehab can be a very important part of trying to reestablish function in those patients. We already mentioned a little bit about fractures, um, but especially fractures of the elbow. This is a Y fracture or bicondylar fracture of the elbow. It's a very serious fracture and difficult to repair. And without proper rehab postoperatively, we end up with a lot of joint stiffness and atrophy in that uh, limb. And so early aggressive rehab after good surgery 
can really improve the function quite a bit. Physeal fractures, especially the distal femoral physeal fracture in puppies. If we have a fracture of the distal femoral growth plate and we do a fracture fixation and don't do any rehab, we are, are at great risk for developing quadriceps contracture or a stiff knee. And it's a very preventable problem, but it's if it occurs, it's very difficult to treat. So prevention in this case is really a big issue. And I'm, I'm dealing with the case right now. In fact, a little four month old Basset puppy that had an ileal fracture, a proximal capital physeal fracture, and a distal femoral physeal fracture all on the same leg. And we really encouraged the owner to leave the dog with us for a week so we could get the rehab started. They uh, denied treatment because of cost considerations. And so they took the puppy home. We had it, had them bring the puppy back. And already 10 days later, there was significant loss of range of motion of the stifle. That dog is headed towards quadriceps contracture. If only we had had that dog for a few days in the hospital, we could have prevented that problem. And we warned the owner at length about that, but they just couldn't afford the, uh, the treatment. So we're going to end up, I think, with a stiff knee in that case. We're trying, but the owner is not willing to do the treatments at home either. And then we can have catastrophic knee injuries with damage to both cruciate ligaments, the collateral ligaments, the menisci, dogs that are hit by a car or a dog that catches an, uh, its leg in a fence or something and damages a lot of the soft tissue structures. Rehab can help a lot with those cases. Arthritis is one of our most common uh, things that we treat with rehab. Up to 60% of dogs that are mature have radiographic osteoarthritis, especially the larger dogs. Now medication can be helpful, but we can improve things even more with rehabilitation and therapeutic exercises. Things like regular low impact exercises to help build muscle mass, to help support the joint enhance cardiovascular condition uh, of the patient, improve joint range of motion, all of those things can be beneficial. But especially valuable are aquatic exercises such as walking in water or an underwater treadmill or even swimming. All of those exercises done in water uh, provides buoyancy. And so the joints are feeling less of the body weight and therefore we can have more muscle strengthening and more unrestricted motion of the joint if we don't have to worry about weight bearing if they're in that aquatic environment. So what can we do in a practice right now? One of the simplest things is simply cryotherapy, a cold pack. And what we're hoping to do with cryotherapy is to reduce bleeding into tissues if we have acute injury or surgery Vasoconstriction helps to reduce the bleeding into the tissues. We can slow down the process of inflammation. It acts as a mild analgesic agent to help with pain. It slows nerve conduction velocity. It raises the threshold of pain transmission. So it is a mild analgesic agent. It can help reduce muscle spasm. And in cases of arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, it can help reduce some of the enzymes that are breaking down the cartilage that normally occur in the process of arthritis. So there are a lot of different ways to apply cooling, regular ice packs or cold packs that are commercially available. Um, here you see a commercially available cold pack. This is a commercial device that um, goes around the animal. It's got uh, inner uh, gel here to keep it cold. We have a zipper here that we can uh, wrap it around the animal's leg and, and zip it closed. And then we have an inflation area here that we can add some compression. So cold and compression can be very um, valuable. Um, ice towels, ice massage, all of these things can be used. And we use cold primarily right after injury or surgery for the first 72 to 96 hours after surgery, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, three to four times a day to keep the edema and inflammation uh, to reduce those things. Now, after three to four days, we may wanna consider superficial heat. 
And what can we use heat for in dogs? Oftentimes, if the dog is a little bit older and has stiffness, um, some arthritis, we can use the heat uh, prior to exercise to help warm up the muscles, help to provide extensibility of tissues. So when we have loss of range of motion, say we have some arthritis, if we apply heat to those tissues, it'll actually help to elongate the collagen. And if we combine that with stretching, we can usually get an immediate increase in a range of motion of about five degrees. So the combination of heating and then immediate stretching. And also heat can help to reduce pain, muscle spasm. A lot of different commercially available hot packs. Um, these are the types that you can put in a microwave oven and heat them up. This particular one comes with a little indicator here that tells you if you're in the correct range uh, heat therapy, or if it's too hot, you don't want to put on a hot pack that's too hot. And if you don't have this indicator, an easy way to do that is to just take the hot pack and put it on the back of your neck. And if you can tolerate it comfortably, then it's safe for the dog. If it's too hot for you, it's too hot for the dog. And then this also tells you when it's time to reheat it if it's getting too cold. We can use deep heating modalities such as therapeutic ultrasound. This is a little bit more advanced modality, but certainly the ultrasound. Now, this is not diagnostic ultrasound. It's therapeutic ultrasound. They're both ultrasound, but this is used for therapeutic applications, primarily for tissue heating and wound healing. So we can use ultrasound. Other things that we can do in practice that are commonly applied are range of motion and stretching. And we've already talked about heating and stretching. Range of motion, if we have injury to a joint or we have arthritis, we wanna make sure that those joints are placed through a complete range of motion at least once a day, all of the joints in the affected limb. Now, you don't wanna try and gain all the range of motion back at once because you'll probably damage tissues if you try and enforce things. What we're trying to do is just get a little bit every day. So within you know, three to four weeks, we have a significant improvement in range of motion. Now, range of motion exercises are especially important in any arthritic patient or any dog with joint surgery. It will not, however, prevent muscle atrophy. It will not help to improve muscle strength or endurance. And it will help with muscle circulation, but not the, um, to the same extent as if we had a voluntary muscle contraction. We can increase circulation to the tissues uh, better with voluntary muscle contraction, but certainly with passive range of motion, we can help with that. So in order to do passive range of motion, we want to place the patient usually in lateral recumbency with the affected limb up, and then we're gonna support the limb to prevent any um, undue stress to the joints. And then we're gonna to start to slowly flex the joint. The other joints in the limb are gonna be maintained in kind of a neutral weight bearing position. So we only wanna work in the, uh, at the target joint at a single time. And we'll flex until the patient first starts to show some initial discomfort. Usually they'll kind of tense up a little bit. They may turn around and look at you, but we don't want to take it to the point where we're creating pain. Then we stop and then we slowly extend the joint again until we repeat or reach that point of initial discomfort. Usually we'll do 15 to 20 repetitions of range of motion, anywhere from twice a day to even five or six times a day, depending on the seriousness of the situation. This is an example of a dog where we're um, doing some elbow range of motion. We're just going to slowly, well, it's not going to play here. Not sure why it's not playing, but you can see how the joint is supported above and below the joint. And um, that will take the stress off of the other joints above and below and um, we'll slowly flex and then extend the joint. And I think because I'm not in presenter mode, for whatever reason, the videos are not playing. I apologize for that. Um, 
Let me just try something else here. You can't see that, can you? Yeah, could you see that at all? Well, the image we can see, sir, the video is not. You can't see the video playing, okay. Not, not sure what the problem is because it worked just before we came live. But yeah. another another thing that we can do is bicycling, where we take the uh, entire limb and place it through an exaggerated range of motion, similar to what you would do with um, riding a bicycle. Then we don't want to forget about the toes. We want to certainly um, stretch the digits, especially if we have any type of a splint or a cast on the limb. Um, the toes, because there are, are such um, small joints and there are so many of them in a, in a small area, they are susceptible to becoming very stiff right from the beginning. And so we wanna make sure that we uh, pay attention to the digits and the toes with our stretching program. Other ways to actively increase range of motion are things to step over raised obstacles, such as these Cavaletti rails. Um, when the dog has to step over a raised object, they have to flex their joints more to do so. And in, especially in the front limb, the elbow joint is the most affected. And in the pelvic limb, the stifle and the tarsus are most affected by stepping over an obstacle. And then in the water, if we have an animal walking in the water, just putting some little flotation device on the leg will really cause them to flex that leg a lot more in the water. So stretching is related to range of motion. We oftentimes do stretching at the same time that we do the range of motion. But in this case, we're kind of holding that end position whether it's flexion or extension for at least 15 seconds. And that's going to allow those tissues to begin to relax and uh, elongate. And then we're gonna allow them to return back to their neutral position. And then we can re-stretch, usually 10 times per session, but up to 20 times. And with slow gradual stretching, we're gonna be damaging the tissues to a less, lesser extent. And if we have chronically stiff tissues, if we do stretching three to five times per week, we can certainly work towards increasing the flexibility of the tissues. And then after we get improvements, we can reduce the frequency of stretching. So this, just to give you an example, was a study that was done in England um, at the veterinary college there where they had some uh, uh, Labrador retrievers that had stiff joints, typically as a result of arthritis and they taught the owners how to do stretches in the home environment. They did 10 stretches with a 10 second hold twice a daily, and they did this for 21 days. And what they found was that uh, most of these were elbow joints. There was one stifle joint. They looked at the range of motion before, and then 21 days later after their stretching program, and you can see the actual improvement in range of motion and then the percent change here. Now, anytime we can get a five degree increase in range of motion, it's clinically significant. The owners can notice an improvement at home. So even five degrees can significantly improve those patients. And some of these had 15 to up to 27 degrees improvement in range of motion. So certainly that can be uh, something that owners can do and something that will improve the patient. Then we can enter a phase of early use um, exercises. The most basic exercise is the standing exercise. This is a dog that had two sites of disc herniation and it had two uh, hemilaminectomies to decompress the spinal cord. And you can see we've got good footing here because a lot of surfaces in veterinary clinics are a little bit slippery. And so we wanna make sure we have good footing for the patient. The patient is standing in a fairly square position and we have this harness around the um, pelvis of the dog. And what we wanna do 
is stand the dog up into a regular standing position and then slowly as the dog weakens and starts to collapse, we're gonna pick the patient back up into a normal standing position. And what we're trying to do is we're working on the postural or the standing muscles to help improve their strength. We're also working on joint position awareness because as those joints are beginning to collapse, um, we want the, the body to react to have a reflex um, increase in the extensor muscles so that the animal doesn't collapse. So standing exercises, very important after early neurologic um, return to function, and also for dogs with severe uh, pelvic fractures as a result of trauma. We can um, help with uh, standing using different physio rolls and Swiss balls. These are things that are commonly used in human sports and rehabilitation. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes. I like the peanuts here for uh, dogs because if we want to stand the dog on the peanut, we have a, a longer platform or we can have the dog uh, kind of rest the forelimbs on the peanut. And here's an example of using the peanut for assisted standing where um, we have the forelimbs on the um, ground here and then the pelvic limbs. And then the ball is helping to keep the dog in a standing position. This dog goes, uh, it's a pretty heavy dog, about 50 kilograms. So uh, a therapist can get quite tired holding that dog up the whole time, but the peanut helps to support the dog. We select the appropriate size and you know, if we need to, we can let some air out of here, out of the ball, and that will increase the weight bearing that the patient has to do. So again, for standing and postural muscles. Um, this is a dog that actually had some pretty severe cervical disc problems, had a dorsal laminectomy. And um, again, it's a very large dog, a Mastiff. And so we have this supported sling system here. This is a, a, a sling lift system that's used to lift human patients, but we can adapt it for dogs. We have a sling for the uh, back end and a sling for the front end. And then in between, we have the peanut supported here. And so we can gently rock the dog back and forth, um, provide a little stimulation to the feet here so that the dog can have some uh, movement of the limbs. We have a lot of other assisted walking devices. Here's that um, lift system that I showed you earlier, just used on a different dog here. Um, we have different uh, slings available to help support the pelvic limbs. And if a dog is doing pretty well, what we can use are these stretchy elastic bands. These are uh, thera, uh, TheraBands is one trade name, but they're elastic bands and they come in different degrees of stiffness. So if we put this under the dog, um, we maintain a little tension on that. And if the dog starts to say lose its balance or collapse or fall, then the band will stretch out, the tension will increase and it'll kind of pull the dog back up into its normal position. So these are quite nice for dogs that are just learning to walk, but they still need a little bit of support to help keep them from falling. Proprioceptive training is a very important part, whether we have neurologic issues or whether we have orthopedic issues. Primarily, we think of proprioceptive training for those with neurologic uh, conditions such as disc herniation, but realize that joints have a lot of joint position awareness fibers, and it's probably these that help to prevent a us from getting um, very advanced osteoarthritis. So if we have a cruciate ligament rupture, that cruciate ligament uh, has a lot of proprioceptive fibers. If the ligament is damaged, we lose that uh, proprioceptive control of the joint. So we have to teach the patient how to use other structures around the knee, the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments to help provide that support in joint position awareness. So proprioceptive training is important for all aspects of rehab. In particular, when we have a neurologic patient, when do we start proprioceptive training? Well, if the animal is able to stand independently, 
Um, if it has some motor function, then we can begin proprioceptive training. And we want to eventually progress to the point where we have dynamic balance training. So while the animal is moving, um, we're shifting the weight, either just pushing on the dog gently or having it do circles or figure of eights, um, using dynamic motion to help improve proprioception. So we really want to challenge the animal, but we have to make sure that we have good flooring and we don't want to challenge them so much that they fall. We wanna make sure that it's a good experience. So here's an example of a dog on a balance board. Um, this dog is, is just gonna be rocked uh, cranial to caudal. So that's one plane. And then we can also have a circular type board here where we place the dog on the board and then we can rotate the dog 360 degrees. So initially we can be very predictive with our movements. Um, you know, the dog can anticipate where the weight shift is going to occur and it will learn how to uh, control its muscles. The brain will tell the muscles to contract and anticipate that this weight shift is going to occur. But eventually we wanna have the dog be able to react to any situation. And so we'll start to make the movements more erratic um, or, or less predictable. And then dynamic weight shifting, um, as the dog is walking, we can gently unbalance the dog here, just push it to the side so that it's off balance and then it has to correct its balance. We can also do things like three-legged standing here to encourage it to learn how to shift its weight and recapture. Um, this is a technique called rhythmic stabilization, another kind of joint position awareness technique. And in this case, we have the dog standing on one of these peanuts. And then what we'll do is we'll sort of bounce the dog on the peanut, uh, like dribbling a basketball. So we push on the dog and it um, uh, compresses the air and the ball, and then it pushes the animal back up into position. So as we're pushing down, the joints are starting to flex a little bit. And then when the reflex extensor uh, action of the muscles occurs, we're working on that joint position awareness as well as muscle strengthening. And then standing on unstable surfaces, in this case, we have uh, this foam rubber mattress here. The dog can stand on that. It's a little bit uh, less stable surface. We can progress to something like this. This is a proprioceptive walkway. We have different surfaces so that the dog's feet can sense a different surface. We can walk the dog over obstacles or up over a curb here, for example. Any type of difference in what the surface that the animal is feeling. Other therapeutic exercises that we can use, um, certainly early limb use exercises are, are primarily walking type exercises. Then we can do other things, conditioning and strengthening. We can have joint specific motion exercises. And finally, the last phase of rehab is speed, strength, and power building to get them back to uh, pretty much normal function. So the basic rules of therapeutic exercise vary the routine. Everybody gets bored doing the same thing all the time. So to keep everybody engaged and fresh, we want to vary what's done. Um, some dogs will do better, do certain activities better than others. So we pick activities that the dog seems to be good at and enjoys doing. That's very important. And we kind of allow the patient to guide an increase in activity. In other words, we use a milestone approach for when we um, add different exercises. If they're able to walk without lameness, then we can progress. And then we go to jogging. And if they're able to jog without lameness, then we go to a different set of exercises. So we sort of see where the patient is in their um, recovery and constantly try and challenge them to get better. Now, one of the rules of exercise is to never hurt a patient because that will actually slow the progress. Um, I mentioned earlier that we had the Bassett puppy that has uh, multiple fractures in the limb. Um, unfortunately, that dog is starting to, to get a little bit resistant to doing any type of range of motion. 
because they associate anything you do when you touch that leg with pain. And so we have to be kind of um, a dog therapist, if you will, in certain cases. And maybe instead of always only touching the dog when we're going to do something, maybe touch the dog and pet it in between sessions so it doesn't get used to always um, associating you with pain. Other things are to um, use treats or something to divert the dog's attention. Anything you can do to help prevent that negative influence of uh, hurting a patient. Okay, so we want to go gently and slowly as opposed to big types of changes and potentially causing pain. We have to be very careful about that because we're dealing with this patient several days a week for a long period of time. So if we don't have the patient comfortable with us manipulating or doing the exercises and they only associate us with pain, then that's going to be bad in the long run. So make it a pleasant experience for them. <clears throat> so early limb use exercises, things like slow walks, assisted walking, walking on a treadmill, going up inclines or declines or hills, using some type of a irritant on the opposite good leg so that they'll put weight on the affected leg. That can be another strategy. So we'll sometimes take a bottle cap or a syringe cap and tape it underneath the foot of the good leg and that acts as an irritant then to have them walk on the uh, affected leg and put more weight. This is just showing walking a dog up a slow uh, incline here, um, handicapped access ramp just for power building in the rear legs. And then if the dog were going downhill, we would be building up the postural muscles in the front leg, trying to have more braking. We can put dogs on a treadmill here, and unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna play either. Um, but certainly, um, the ground moving underneath the dog can really uh, increase proprioceptive training. We've had many dogs that have had subtle neurologic problems that actually do very well on the ground, but you put them on a treadmill and they start knuckling every third or fourth stride because the treadmill, the ground moving underneath the dog really challenges their proprioception. So excellent training for dogs with subtle neurologic problems or recovering from neurologic issues. This is what I was mentioning to you before about the syringe cap on the bottom of the good foot. Um, this will act as an irritant and they'll forget about the affected leg and start putting more weight on that leg. As we add more and more exercises, we reach a higher plane of recovery. We can start to do more conditioning and other special exercises, certainly increasing the distance of incline or decline walking, maybe jogging up instead of walking. We can have faster walks or even jogging on a treadmill. We can incorporate stairs. We can use aquatic therapy. So all of these things can build strength and power. So having a dog walk or even trot up steps can, um, it, the dogs use different motion in their joints and they also develop more power, especially in the hind legs going up the stairs and in the forelimbs coming down the stairs. This dog is in an underwater treadmill, so we have the advantage of both the buoyancy of the water, we have the advantage of the treadmill belt moving underneath the dog to help increase proprioceptive training. We have the resistance of moving the leg through the water so we can get muscle strengthening because it takes more muscle to walk through the water than it does through air. And then when you walk in water, you use your joints differently. You have more flexion of your joints. If you think of yourself walking in a pool or in the water at the beach, um, when you walk in the water, you're flexing your joints to move through the water more than you would on the dry ground. And so you can get increased range of motion with um, the, the, uh, the drag of the water. So muscle strengthening through a greater range of motion and certainly swimming in a pool. Um, the difference between underwater treadmill walking or walking in water and swimming is that with walking, 
their feet are on the ground and they have to extend their joints to a normal standing position. The way that dogs swim, they swim with the limbs in a very flex position. They never completely extend the limbs to a normal standing position. And so although you do get more range of motion with uh, swimming in terms of flexion, you won't get the extension that you, you'll get with walking in water. So, uh, you know, I, I think you need to decide is flexion more of a problem or do we need to have more extension? And that will help to make some of the difference between whether you walk in water or swim. Um, specific joint motion exercises. These are exercises that target um, motion of particular joints. Again, walking up and down inclines and stairs will increase flexion of certain joints. Wheelbarrowing, where we increase the activity of the forelimbs, will increase elbow flexion and shoulder extension more. Dancing will uh, put more weight on the back legs if we lift the front up and have the dog just stand on the back legs. Depending on whether we go forward or backward, um, we can increase or decrease flexion and extension of certain joints there. Stepping over the Cavaletti rails that we mentioned earlier, we can target different joints to flex more based on the height of the rails. Sit to stand exercises, going through tunnels or underneath um, a limbo pole, for example. So by lifting the back leg of the dog up, we shift more of the weight to the front limbs. And so we're going to get more strengthening of the forelimb muscles. And when we measure the joint angles compared to just normal walking, we have about 10 degrees more elbow flexion and about 10 degrees more shoulder extension when we do wheelbarrowing activities. With dancing, lifting the front leg of the dog up and then moving forward and backwards, um, we're going to be putting more extension of the hip joint dancing backwards because the dogs will tend to be more vertical that opens up the hip angle. So if we have a dog with hip dysplasia where hip extension is painful, dancing backward may not be such a good exercise. But if we dance them forward, there's not very much hip extension here beyond a normal standing position. So we're getting strengthening of the rear limb muscles, but we may not stress the hip joint as much by dancing forward. So that would be an activity. In the sit to stand exercise where we have the dog stand or sitting squarely and symmetrically, and then we want them to push up squarely and symmetrically. So one trick that we can do, some dogs, let's say that this dog has had a cruciate uh, repair of the left stifle, and we have the dog in a square sitting position with that leg against the wall. That way he has to push up from underneath the body. He can't slide that leg out to the side and um, not push up on it. So having him in a, a corner like this with the affected leg against the wall will encourage him to, to uh, stand up squarely and symmetrically. Now, some dogs are maybe not as um, strong. They can't push up from a full sitting position. So we can have the dog sit on a raised platform like we see here and then they only have to push up part of the way, or we can have them sit with this little peanut between them here. So a lot of different tricks here. We can do the Cavaletti rails. We have rails of different height, they're spaced differently. So not only are we gonna work on joint motion, but also proprioception as they step over the rails. We can have them weave back and forth, kind of in a figure of eight pattern, uh, moving from side to side to teach the dog how to pivot and turn very gradually and slowly, how to control those muscles. So when they go out to chase the squirrel or uh, a, a cat um, and they turn and pivot quickly, they don't damage the repair. They've learned how to control their muscles to do that turn and pivot. And also spinal motion, if we have them go through the, the cones here, um, the back will flex and bend around those and we'll get more spinal flexibility if we have some spinal arthritis. And then we move to the final phase here where we're trying to get more speed and power. So we're adding more uh, speed such as trotting upstairs, running up inclines or declines, 
um, doing some dancing or wheel bearing with resistance, maybe doing some weight training by pulling or carrying weights, uh, playing ball, doing some core strengthening. So let's talk about some of these. Just jogging can certainly increase the force placed on the limb, which requires more muscle strength and uh, rapid muscle contraction to, to move the joints more quickly. So that can be the first start of power and strength building. We can use resistance. This is again a TheraBand, which is one of those elastic stretchy bands. We can place it on a limb and provide resistance to movement, similar to what's used in human sports training, where we can, um, for example, do biceps curl with a resistance band. Um, this particular dog is on a treadmill, and so we have a TheraBand tied to the limb here. So when the dog tries to advance the limb, we're working on increasing hip flexor and knee extensor muscle strengthening. So we just provide a little bit of tension here, let the dog pull against that resistance, and we're gonna get some muscle strengthening. In this particular situation, we're pulling the band laterally. And let's say we have a condition called medial shoulder instability, which we'll, we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, the subscapularis muscle is weak. And so during the swing phase of gait, if we pull just gently a little bit laterally here, they have to work their adductor muscles to pull the limb back into position. And the subscapularis muscle is one of those muscles. So this is a way to target strengthening of that particular muscle group. So the basic rule of TheraBand is to pull in the direction opposite of the muscle group you're trying to strengthen, okay? We can use weighted vests, even putting a kilogram of weight in a vest. If you think about how many repetitions the dog does while standing, you're adding some body weight here. So you're working on those postural muscles, those extensor muscles that are keeping the dog from collapsing. We can add leg weights. Um, we can just put the weight on the distal end of the, the uh, leg here. And then when the dog advances the leg, we're working the flexors in that case because the uh, weight of the leg is increased. And so in order to pick the leg up during the swing phase of gait, we're primarily working the flexor muscles more in that situation. And if we have let's say a radial nerve issue where we have radial nerve weakening, um, we can put a leg weight on there and just do something like shake hands exercise. So we're trying to increase the strength of the elbow flexors here that might have been damaged. Core strengthening, we hear a lot about that with human uh, sports and exercise, strengthen your core for better fitness. We can do that in dogs as well. So in this case, we have the four limbs of the dog on this platform, and then we have this um, foam roller here. So we have the dog's hind legs on that, and it's important that they keep the legs in contact with that surface. The goal is not to have them pick the legs up and move them. The goal is to strengthen the cores here. So we're only gonna roll that maybe a centimeter in either direction, and we're gonna make sure that the feet stay on that surface. And so they're really engaging their abdominal muscles and their core muscles here to help strengthen those. So very important how you do that. Another way to do core strengthening uh, in a home environment is to simply have a wagon. A lot of uh, owners have you know, garden carts, that sort of thing. So you can keep the back legs on some good footing here, firm surface and then the front legs on the wagon. And then again, the goal is not to get the dog to move the feet. You want the feet to stay in position here, and then you'll slowly roll the wagon just a centimeter or two, and then back. And again, trying to engage and strengthen those core muscles here. And we can do more advanced things. What this video was to show was the dog kind of in the sphinx position, and then using a treat we lure the dog up so the front legs push up and stand on the ball. And that takes a lot of core strength, takes a lot of forelimb extension strength, primarily the triceps, to go from this flex-legged uh, plank position or sphinx position to a standing plank here. 
And then some of the final things to increase uh, power and strength, things like ball playing, starting off with an enclosed area here and just throwing the ball and having the dog power uh, after the ball with a couple of a few very powerful strides, working on speed as well as uh, increasing the, the very uh, sudden extension of those muscles. So we have the ability to really improve the outcome of surgical as well as non-surgical conditions with physical rehabilitation. A good knowledge of the medical conditions, their treatments, and especially the response of the tissues to disuse and remobilization is critical to success. And overall, what we're trying to do is enhance the quality of life, owner satisfaction, and the owner's uh, enjoyment of their pets. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, seminar. I apologize for the technical issues. We'll try and get those worked out before tomorrow. But if you're interested in learning more about rehab, I would invite you to um, uh, look at our Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner Program. That's administered through the Veterinary Academy of Higher Learning. The website is here. We have a series of online uh, courses to go at your own pace. And then we also have in-person laboratory, uh, laboratory courses where we practice some of these exercises and we work on some patients. And if you're interested in, in learning more about causes of lameness, I've got a website for dog owners and also for veterinarians and veterinary nurses, mylamedog.com. And in about two weeks, we'll be launching a new website, mylamedogsvet.com, which is specifically for veterinarians. And I've got a, um, uh, a, a program put together. It's all online, non-surgical orthopedics, so improving your um, orthopedic exam skills, your gait evaluation skills, um, how to improve and, and diagnose things faster so that we can treat them earlier. Because like anything else, the earlier we find the problem, the more successful the, the treatment can be. So early recognition and awareness of different dog conditions and then instituting early therapy, I think are key. So. That will be coming live in just a couple of weeks. So I hope to see you in one of these programs and I hope to see you again tomorrow. So I'll turn it back to our hosts. Um, thank you, Dr. Darius, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, with your permission, what we can do is, I think we just lost on, uh, I just counted, maybe there were seven or eight videos uh, which uh, were not uh, played. So what we can do, sir, is, I mean, since this issue is very minor one, which, I mean, you know, we did try two days back in the night and it worked just fine. If something has to go wrong, it will go wrong. Mm -hmm. and this has been my experience also in the IIT for the past 10 years. So what, what we'll do is, sir, is once this uh, uh, session is over and whenever you have time during the, I mean, during the next few hours, we'll just get back to it. We'll fix this issue and these present, these videos which were not played, we can play them tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, I mean, first in the tomorrow session so what okay. i'll do later on is I'll, I'll also have the recording of those videos and i'll add them to this session so when if anyone who is going to watch the session again they would be able to watch the session so there won't be any loss of user experience sir. okay if, 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 if you are comfortable with that sir yeah that's fine uh, thank you all right, sir. Uh, since uh, we are also running out of time and uh, as you had only given us one hour, uh, we won't be taking any question and answers. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go through those questions, the relevant one. I, I'll, I can uh, add them for tomorrow's Q&A session. Okay. Yes, sir. I'll just hand, hand it over to Dr. Shalaka, sir, for the conclusion. Okay. Hello, sir. So that was a very, very informative, enlightening session and all these comments are uh, being uh, mentioned in Q&A sessions. We will uh, share it with you, sir, but most of the uh, our participants are very, very happy with the session and they can't wait for tomorrow's sports medicine session. And so do, like um, my husband said, uh, due to short of time, we won't be uh, taking questions right now. We will include them in tomorrow's session, sir. And uh, tomorrow uh, we will be uh, uh, we will be again meeting at 7 uh, p.m. India time, sir. And uh, Dr. Darrell will be presenting on canine sports medicine tomorrow. 
so sir uh, uh, thank you so much sir for this uh, session sir and i am very very thankful to dr mv dumar sir our dean sir who has been uh, supporting us right from the uh, the idea was point and he is still with us online live here so dumar sir thank you so much for supporting uh, this Thanks. webinar sir Good. thank you thank you sir Good. so we will meet tomorrow thank you everybody thank you for joining thanks a lot okay thank you bye 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 sir